understanding of the ore, but to the origin of the ore. The relationship of the processes which produce ore to the processes which produce, for example, igneous rocks. We shall also look briefly at the way that ore was mined at the beginning of this century, a little historical aside, at the end of the following hour, an hour on ore deposits. We've already looked at minerals as the components of rocks, at the silicate minerals, for example, which make up the igneous rocks. But minerals don't always occur mixed together as the components of rocks. Sometimes certain minerals are found in local concentrations. And in this case, we refer to a mineral deposit. And if that deposit is composed of valuable minerals, which can be mined at a profit, then we refer to an ore deposit. Now, generally speaking, ore is reserved for those minerals which are metallic, like pyrite, for example, which look like metals. But the most important part of the definition of ore is that it can be mined at a profit. Now, although the mineral industry contributed something in the order of $15 billion to Canada's economy in 1975, finding ore deposits is not easy. A uh, modern prospector needs all this kind of gadgetry to find ore deposits, and prospectors in the last century, with their experience and their hammer and their gold pan, were faced with an even more difficult task. Special problems were, and still are, posed not only by the vastness of the country, but also by the climate. The long, hard winters, especially over the northern shield areas, create special problems not only in finding the ore, but also problems of transport, problems of getting equipment in and getting the ore out. This has been a special problem in the Arctic. In fact, what is ore in southern Ontario may not be ore in the Arctic simply because of the difficulty of getting it out again. Temperature may in itself be no problem, but snow for the prospectors is what covers the outcrops in the winter, and in the summer, caribou moss and lichen blankets the outcrops, making it very difficult to spot just what the bedrock is, and of course, making prospecting very difficult. But most of the problems have to do with vastness and difficulty of access. Quebec, for example, is alone twice the size of Texas and four times the size of France. Much of the terrain is covered with muskeg and very difficult bush and is cut through by rivers that are quite often difficult to, to navigate. Under these circumstances, much of the early work in mountainous areas was done with pack horses, especially in mountainous areas such as BC. In the flatter areas like northern Ontario, much work was done with canoe. The instruments available to the early prospectors were very, very simple, and they mostly had to rely on a pick and on experience. Many deposits were discovered simply by chance, for example, by pulling moss off outcrops. Much of the gold in the Kirkland Lake and Porcupine area was discovered in just this way. Many early prospectors did strike it rich, for example, in the Yukon gold rushes and so forth. But sometimes, looking back in retrospect, it's a wonder that anything was found at all. The tools were so simple. Here, a prospector looking for gold and his stream gravel. Not very many of them 
struck it rich. There were many others who spent a lifetime and found virtually nothing. Searching and finding ore became a very much less hit and miss business once the origin of ores became better understood. And understanding the origin of ores has to do with understanding how the minerals, the ore minerals, became concentrated. Now, there are a number of relatively obvious ways. For example, the washing together of gold nuggets in a stream is a relatively easy way of concentrating a mineral and making an ore deposit. But most ore deposits come about through concentration mechanisms that are associated with igneous intrusions, with the crystallization of a magma to form an igneous melt. But before looking at that, it's, it's worthwhile remembering just how concentrated the mineral has to become in order to become an ore. For example, this is a specimen of molybdenum ore. Now, normally, molybdenum occurs to the extent of one thousandth of one percent in the Earth's crust. In order to be ore, it has to be concentrated to the extent of one-tenth of one percent. Lead is a little more common than molybdenum. It's found on average about somewhere between one and two thousandths of one percent, but it has to be concentrated to the extent of four percent in a rock before that rock can be mined as ore. So when we're looking at the means of concentrating minerals, we're looking at means that are effective in producing concentrations of a hundred, a thousand, and more fold. One of the principal means of producing some of the largest ore deposits has to do with the crystallization, the early crystallization of mafic magmas, those rich in iron and magnesium. Let's have a look at a diagram that you probably remember from the unit on igneous rocks, this one. Remember that we spoke of crystals forming early that were rich in iron and magnesium, sinking to the bottom and forming a layer, which then solidified as a mafic igneous rock. While that's going on, something else is going on also. And we can see that on this diagram. Sulfur atoms, which are present in the magma, combine also with iron to form pyrite, and also combine with copper to form copper sulfides. Sulfur competes, if you like, with the oxygen silicon tetrahedra in order to form minerals. And the form in which the sulfides get together is as droplets, and they're heavy, and they sink through uh, the mush of crystals in the intrusion, sink to the bottom to form a solid layer of sulfide. We can see a solid sulfide in quite a number of ore specimens, especially those from around the Sudbury area. Here are a couple. These specimens are solid sulfide, originally droplets that sank to the bottom of an igneous intrusion. And we can see the stages to that solid sulfide in these specimens. This one here, for example, shows very clearly the droplets of sulfide reflecting there in the light between the dark silicate minerals of the rock. And the same kind of thing on this specimen, where the sulfur shines and the rock is dark. So that's one means of producing concentrations of useful minerals, producing an ore deposit. But there are other kinds of ore which, with which you're quite familiar, at least you've read about. Veins, how are veins produced? This for example, is a vein containing lead sulfide and copper sulfide. How are veins produced? What is their association with igneous intrusions? Well, this time we have to go back to another stage in the crystallization of an igneous intrusion. We have to go back to the last stages of its crystallization. We can see that.